morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We're so glad you've joined us online to worship with us together. We want you to know a few things by way of announcements. First, if you have been following us online, you inevitably know now that this is our last online worship experience for the foreseeable future. There's a couple of reasons for that. We are fully back in person now at both nine o'clock and 11 in worship, and the demands of in-person worship are have risen to a level in which it is, we cannot continue uh, effectively to do online worship. What we will do is film, edit, and then upload our Sunday worship, and you'll be able to follow along with us during the week. So I do I am sorry for those who have been following us each Sunday that we couldn't maintain this. Uh, a lot of the reason is just because right now I'm the only minister on staff. Uh, as we continue to hire and to bring in more staff as the year goes on, uh, I do foresee us uh, still engaging in an online community of grace. That is the future of the church. Uh, we just have a lot of in-person demands right now, and my time needs to be shifted to that. So I hope you do understand, but if you would like to help and to volunteer or have any suggestions for an online church ministry, I'm always open to hear them, and uh, I believe it is a part of God's good future too. The second announcement that I have is next week on the 23rd is a very important Sunday because we are not going to be in the building, at least we hope not, because we're going to be outside having an outdoor worship experience at 10 a.m., it is Pentecost, and we're going to have a birthday party for the church. I hope you'll come and celebrate. We're going to honor our 50-year member club. And we're also going to recognize our graduating class of 2021. And then also there will be cake and streamers and noisemakers. The choir is going to be there. It's going to be a party outside. If it does rain, we will move everything into the sanctuary together. So 10 o'clock next Sunday on the 23rd. We look forward to celebrating with you. And also, we're going to share in communion together. So for that reason alone, we look forward to seeing you. We're so glad you've been able to worship with us online. Let us go to God together in prayer. Everlasting God, we pause collectively in our souls. Our consciousness is ready to receive, to engage. This time of worship is for you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Hi everybody. I've got some candy here. It's called Everlasting Gobstopper Candy. It's a type of jawbreaker. They're hard little candies and they're from a book and also a movie you might have seen. Have you ever heard of Everlasting Gobstopper Candy? Well, if you've ever read the book of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, or see one of the movies about that book, you might remember that Everlasting Gobstopper Candy was in that movie. It was something that Willy Wonka, the candy maker, wanted to make for kids that lasted forever. No, long, no, no matter how long you, you had it in your mouth, you could, you could take it out and put it back in the next day. It lasted forever. It's a fun idea to make something so good last forever, but well, you and I know that that can't really happen, right? Candy doesn't really last forever. It was just in the book for fun. But I can think of some things that last forever, like God's love. God's love is everlasting. It lasts forever. It's eternal. It never ends. That's a really good thing that lasts forever. And there's something else. God gives us eternal life. Life that is everlasting. It lasts forever. Now you might be thinking, now wait a minute. Life doesn't last forever. And you're right. Life on earth doesn't. Plants die, animals die, people do die. And there's some sad things about that for sure. But God promises us that there's something when we're done with life on this earth. There's something waiting, something really good, something really special. It's a gift from him to us. And it last forever. And that makes sense. Because if God shares his everlasting love with us, when we're done with everything here on earth, it makes sense that that everlasting love would, would live on somehow. And I think that's what it means when we talk about eternal life, everlasting life with God. That love that he shares with us somehow lives on. Now, I don't really understand all of, all of it yet because I'm still here on earth. I think it's something special that we have to look forward to later. Something special and everlasting that God has planned for us that is part of the wonder of God, what makes God so amazing. So I have a challenge for you. The next time that you're walking through a candy store or, or a store that just sells candy and you happen to see this candy, Everlasting Gobstoppers, I want you to stop for just a second or two and think, hmm, Everlasting. I know something Everlasting. And think about God. Everlasting God, eternal God, and how the love of God is everlasting. It is eternal, and his love never ends. God is everlasting.
Our scripture lesson today comes from 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 9 and then going through verse 13. Listen as I read God's word. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God is light and love, and both lead to eternal life. You could say all of life is in God. God is in the whistling of the trees and the snowflakes and the kittens and the pollen that stains our cars. But God is also way more. God is in the deep emotional connection you get with when a memory bubbles up. God is in the 60,000 memories or thoughts that we have every day. God is in the connection of the warmth of the sun hitting our face on a day when nothing is due and everything is clean and you can pause for a moment and realize that you aren't alone in this universe and that something amazing is with you. God is all of that and more. There's an image that I want you to see. You'll need to sit with this for a moment. It's just a diagram of helpful metaphors throughout history on how theology talks about God. The first is theism. This is the most classical view of God and the longest one that we've had. God and the universe are separate. God is up here, we are down here, the two shall never meet because the universe is riddled with sin. So God sends an advocate 
to rescue us from that sin. And that advocate is Jesus. This is the predominant way of understanding God in the world. We separate God out. We place God beyond the margins of the universe and label God as distant or other. And honestly, this is the most classical view for a reason. Because God really is always more than we can speak about or comprehend. So it does make sense to put God outside the container of the universe. God's transcendence puts God beyond, into an unknowing. And therefore, people see that kind of God as something that could be feared. Because that God has the power to afflict and to hurt and is beyond us and we don't understand it. But that God also has the power to give love. So down here, we worry about a God above and beyond out there. So we worship. We try to appease that God, hoping that that God will send us blessings and not cursings. Tsunamis and cancer and broken relationships, they're all byproducts from an unknowable separate God. But so is financial stability and good marriages and good vacations. God has the ability to curse and bless, and all of this happens from beyond. In this classical view, God is utterly transcendent, distant, separate. But God is more than that, too. In the 1700s, a new way of thinking emerged in the universe. We know it as pantheism. Instead of God being transcendent, sitting on a throne in heaven, distant and away from us, God is imminent, right here, next to us. And we can listen to this God and talk to this God and trust that this God understands us and intimately knows us because this God is bound to the same time and space and world as us. We are literally in this life together. And I think the picture makes this clear. Pantheism sees God as the universe. So there's no remoteness to God. God is everywhere right here. I don't love this view, but there's a lot of people that do, and it has merit. It introduces us to the imminence of God. Roughly 150 years later, around the mid-1800s, a more nuanced, more developed thought emerged, though. Panentheism. And I'll be straight with you. I am all about this. Panentheism takes the best of classical theism and the best of pantheism and combines them. It sees God as both transcendent, yet simultaneously imminent. God holds all of life, all of our experiences and thoughts, all of our hopes and dreams, but yet God is still beyond. The whole of the cosmos is bound within God, and yet God is still more. God holds us, but still exists beyond us. I love this. The first time I heard about panentheism, things clicked in a way that had never before. I've always had issues with classical theism. I didn't like the construct of a remote God who was only to be feared. It seemed to reject the God of is love motif of 1 John. Pantheism, though, seemed to dismiss the whole notion of otherness and transcendence and omniscience and eternal life of God. Panentheism, though, is the best of both. God is both simultaneously transcendent and imminent, which is a paradox. Our language and thought processes don't allow for something to be both unknowable and intimately understandable. Yet that's what God is. The concept of God is a paradox. God is both unknowable and yet intimately understandable and experienced. Transcendent and imminent. And then the last point I'll address quickly from the diagram makes all of this go one step further. This last image is known as process theology or open and relational theology. The idea of God here shows that we are entangled in an infinite web of co-laboring and building alongside God to ultimately bring about God's good future. Not because God needs us, but because God chooses us. In God's great goodness, God chooses to us to build alongside with, 
towards eternity because God is love. And the God that is love allows us the freedom to join in the creating process in an open and relational way. God lets humanity join in the creating process and we move together towards the infinite. I'll stop here. You didn't know you were getting a master's level thesis this morning. I just want you to see this image. It's important. And I want you to know that there's merit to all four of these views. There are pros and significant advantages to each. One is not more right than the other, for they are all in their own ways, correct and incomplete. We cannot fully capture the essence of God, but what we can do is imagine it, draw an image of it, create a metaphor to help explain it, and that's what theology has done over the years. And you can see it gets more nuanced and more developed, and you can see the evolution of consciousness as theology evolves. And I think all of this is just so fascinating, and it is directly connected to the end of 1 John 5. In our scripture lesson today, we're introduced to the phrase, eternal life. Everything is moving towards eternity. All of our actions and hopes and theology and practices, all of our faith is moving us towards the ultimate end that we know as eternal life. And one of those metaphors that 1 John helps us construct is that God is the holder of all of life. So when we engage with this God in the created order by following the life and teachings of Jesus, we are invited into eternity. 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I need to tell you a secret. There's not one preacher or theologian or person of any kind who knows exactly what eternal life looks like, not academically speaking. We don't really know if there are streets of gold or if there's a mansion or a river or a throne or a tree, but we are given these beautiful images in scripture and we hold them in our soul. And most of these images come from the Johannine community. We've talked about this each week. The gospels or the gospel of John, first, second, and third John and Revelation all emerged from this same church group known as the Johannine community. They identifiably share similar theologies and understandings of God. And a huge gift we are given from this community is the concept of eternal life. As a matter of fact, this phrase, eternal life, is only mentioned 51 times in the Bible. 45 of those are from the New Testament. It's surprising that the Old Testament doesn't really talk much about the afterlife. So out of those 45 New Testament sayings, the Johannine community writes 24 of them. No other New Testament book even gets close to talking about eternal life. This Johannine church truly believed that Christ was coming back in their lifetime and taking them to eternal life so we could all be with God for eternity. And this squarely fits with how 1 John concludes. Now, I may not know exactly what happens when we die, but I do know that I get to do a funeral tomorrow for the husband of a woman in our church, and I will stand before her family as a faithful representation of a faith that preaches the imminence and transcendence of God. And I will say with great compassion to the widow that her husband has gone to be with the Lord. No more sting, no more death, just peace and rest. I believe this because of the theology and traditions like 1 John 5. Look at verse 11. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. I'll end our sermon series here and say, I hope you'll read this little book slowly, intentionally. Wrestle with the ideas of who God is and how you live your life for and towards and alongside 
that God. I hope you'll see the deep, powerful love they have for one another as a church and their hope in Jesus as their Savior. And I hope you'll know that you're called to work alongside God who is a both light and love too, which means you are to be light and love. And when and as you do this good work for and with God, you follow the life of Jesus to accomplish it. And when you do that, you experience and you inherit eternal life. Oh.